name is Keith Kelso. I work at Michigan Trigger Company. I'm the Agricultural Operations Manager. In my position, I work with all our harvest systems that our growers have. I work with logistics and moving beets around from field to field and from factory to factory. So today we're talking about harvest and uh, what we can do to improve on our harvest, if anything. Our growers do a great job of, of planting and taking care of excellent high quality crop. They do a great job of harvesting, but there's always something that possibly could be lacked or something that could be improved on. These beets can be prepared for long-term storage so that once they get into the pile, they can store, we can cool them down, they can store for as long as we need them to. The soil is, is something that really impacts. It's harder for us to, to pile the beets and it's much harder for them to store. Some of our growers have self-propelled harvesters which have scalpers on them for the defoliation phase of harvest. And a scalper goes through and actually takes the scalp right off of the beet. Obviously, this is what a scalp looks like. You know, it's got the leaves intact, it's got part of the crown. Generally, what we recommend is to leave as much of the crown as you can in the field where you don't want it to hurt your yield, but there is the most impurities of the beet are in the crown. So if we're, if we're having a lot of crown material with, with leaf material, we actually could improve our sugar content if we left some crowns in the field. So obviously on a self-propelled harvester, we have no choice because that's their mode of, their main mode of, of defoliation. But uh, we generally say about the size of this, which is about the size of a silver dollar. Of course, if you have a, if you have a really tall crown and a lot of petioles and leaves going down the side of it, we may have to make this more aggressive and actually cut, cut this, this, uh, this scalp farther down. But we're not as concerned about the volume or the weight of the beet we're leaving in the field, we're more concerned to get those, that leaf material off so that we can have uh, no leaves and actually the beet will store better. It's going to produce less heat and let, it'll burn less energy. So these things are very important for the long-term storage so that when we put our beets in our piles, they can store three, four, five months down the road and uh, give us a high quality crop, give us a very good beet payment and make the most sugar that we can make. Hello, my name is John Norlos, and uh, we're gonna introduce the Tiger 5 and some of the various settings on it to do a, a good job of harvest, either under dry conditions or wet. I've uh, operated a machine myself on the home farm for since 2002, and since that, the machine has uh, changed a little bit and uh, fine-tuned a little bit, and we're here to explain some of the adjustments of the machine for a good harvest. When I approach a field, I try to picture in my mind, is this a consistent field? There's the variations. How high might the beets be out of the ground? Uh, what are the conditions? Are they dry or wet? And that automatically uh, tells me a little bit where I should think about my settings. If it's uh, very dry, I will begin to think about the roller bed, how far it's off the ground, uh, because the, the ground will pulverize and disappear very quickly through the rolls. If it's wet, I will keep my roller bed up higher to allow a lot of that dirt to fall out. That's my first thinking, and you do that over here. <clears throat> the roller bed would be right here, and under dry conditions, I keep it fairly close to the ground, which would be a number two or number three setting on the screen. If I have to go deeper, I'll go to zero, but that's not too often. Usually under dry conditions, the digging shares um, in between the steel wheels here also need to go deep. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, takes a lot of force to get them into the ground, but also because that ground pulverizes, it disappears quickly and you like to have a little bit of dirt on the rolls to cushion the beets. We want to maintain the tail uh, to stay with the beet throughout the harvester and off to the factory. So to change my height of the roll from the ground, this is a shaft that goes across the machine and can be adjusted up and down from the cab, uh, settings from zero to 20. Uh, it's only under very wet conditions that this would be closer to the 20. Under dry, it would be closer to the zero. Same with the depth shanks in, be, in behind the steel wheels. 
There's a steel tube that goes all the way across the machine. All the shanks are tied to that and that goes up and down. So same thing there, dry conditions closer to the zero, wet conditions closer to the 15 or 20. So that's first what goes through my mind when I enter a field. It doesn't take long <clears throat> when you enter the field. You can see how high the beats are out of the ground from the window of the cab. And that's what determines how high I'm going to have my defoliator off the ground. <coughs> that is achieved by the, the wheels up front with a hydraulic cylinder, also setting from 0 to 20. Uh, so if the beats are, uh, let's say, 5, 6 inches out of the ground, I'll be around a 10 to 12. From the cab, I will see the beat before it hits the scalper here and I attempt to have stems left on the beats about three inches long. So if you have variations in the field, usually the knolls where the beats are a little thinner, a little higher on the ground, my, steel, or my rubber wheels would have to be lower so that the defoliator is higher and uh, I can pre-program that in my computer as well so when I hit that spot I just hit one or two for the selected spot and it will automatically make those changes to where I wanted them before. So after I've seen the beat go in front of the scalper, I can monitor how much of a scalp is taken off the beat because I'll see the beat before it hits the, the digging shares. Um, we want to have enough of a scalp so all the greens are off. Uh, just a few greens left on is not critical because they will be taken off through the rest of the machine. But if there's a, a too many greens left on the, the beat before it gets to the machine, it's going to be difficult to get all of them off before we get to the beat pile. So I'm attempting to take probably about 90% of the greens off here before it gets to the rest of the machine. Adjustment of the scalper is also done from the cab. There's a monitor here on the, on the defoliator, but there's also on the screen in the cab from 0 to 20. 20, the bar raises as high as possible, and the scalper does a minimal job of uh, scalping. As I lower the bar, the scalper is more aggressive on the scalping. Then the beat passes to the digging share. So I've gone through that process already of thinking where that share should be and the roller bed. Initially, I'm not driving real fast in the field yet. And I had my shares all the way down in dry ground. As I'm feeling comfortable with my settings, I start to pick up speed. That means I'll be getting more dirt in the rolls. It might mean that I can start raising the bed and maybe raising the shares a little bit. As I raise the shares, I'm watching from the cab window to make sure that the tails are still on the beat. If you start seeing snapped beats at that point, it's maybe good to get outside, scratch in the furrow to see if there's beat tails left there, or go a little deeper and see if that solved the uh, solution or gave the solution. So um, once the beat gets onto the rolls, I consider what uh, speed I should be running them. Initially, I was still driving slow in the field, but I'm starting to pick up speed. Uh, that means that there's more beats on the beat on the roller bed. I need to speed them up just to clear the dirt. The wetter the dirt is, the higher the speed on the rolls. Under dry conditions, very seldom above six or seven. Under wet, dirty conditions, yeah, you'll bring it up to 10 or to maximum just to pull the dirt out of it. Right now, it's very dry conditions, and this machine uh, has a large number three and a large number five in there. Uh, purpose of that is uh, it's early and it's dry so you're going to have some small beats with the larger rolls in there it will maintain those beats. When it gets wet and sticky we'll take the big ones out put smaller ones in to allow more dirt to fall through. So on the back side here there's a roll that's driven hydraulically separate from the rest of the head 
And this one can be rolled uh, counterclockwise or clockwise to act as a pinch roll to pull extra dirt out. So under dry conditions, you just roll it uh, without the pinch so the beets can move easily to the center and through the rest of the machine. Or if you have a lot of weeds or uh, stems uh, in the beet, foliage still in the beets, you can have it acting as a pinch roll to pull some of that garbage out. As the beets move to the center, there we call it the belly chain that uh, is behind this wheel. Uh, between the, the two wheels under the axle, transfer the beets from the head to the cleaning turbines in between. Here again, uh, you have to see what kind of volume of beets you have. Um, you don't want to have these spinning at a high speed with little volume of beets. It'll do too much thrashing on the beet to uh, break pieces off. But as your volume increases, uh, you can speed up their turbines and you won't notice any more uh, damage than when they were running at a slow speed with little beets. They, they cushion each other. The purpose of these is for more cleaning action, a little bit different cleaning than we had in the rolls. Right now it's very dry and we call these gates. There's gates on the outside of all three turbines because there's very little dirt to deal with at this point. When it turns muddy, we can take a, one of these gates off and you can put another bracket in there with nine pigtails to replace that one gate and that creates more friction for the beet, causes more tumbling for more scrubbing action. As it gets more muddy, you can take all the gates off and replace them with pigtails. Pigtails will slow the process down a little bit, but when it is real muddy and wet, there's the, it loses that friction. It's going to flow anyway. On the, uh, on the turbines, we have uh, what we call the pusher rod. It's a heavier rod with a, uh, an obstruction up a little higher just to keep the beets moving, push them through. Uh, later on in the season as the beets get larger and there's very little of the small ones and if you're under muddy conditions this, these gates can be raised off of the turbine and under real muddy conditions I've been three four inches off of the turbines and, and not lose beets. The Turbines have their individual adjustments. Um, there is a program from uh, 1 to 10, so you can select that. And if you're a pro at it and you don't like the settings that are programmed in the uh, computer, you can speed up or slow down each individual turbine on, on your own. Um, not very often necessary, it's just sometimes people like to uh, play with it. Um, so then the beets get dropped into what we call the ring conveyor. That's this fellow here, it goes all the way around the machine and that uh, uh, drops the beet into the tank and uh, as soon as the center fills up in the tank, the auger in the very top will move it to the back. There's a sensor at the back that tells you how full it is and when it's, the back end is full, it automatically reverses that auger to fill the front. What is nice about that is when you're sitting in the cab, you can just look through the back window, okay, what kind of a job am I, am I doing? It's just like sitting in a combine and looking in the grain tank, how much chaff is in there. Um, that way you can make your adjustments to, uh, to achieve a better sample. So. If we go to the field and we see a lot of uh, issues with the cospra, where the leaves, or frozen beets for that matter, where the leaves are really drooping around the beet, we need to get the defoliator down to the beet as far as possible. We don't want to flail the beet with the defoliator, and yet we need to get that dry, rubbery material off so it's not sent off to the factory. Plus it hangs around the machine and it really doesn't do the machine any good either. So we can't leave it all up to the scalper. 
because the scalper is riding on the top of that beet and just taking a little skin off and that rubbery material doesn't cut very well. So we need to most likely speed up the defoliator. Normally it's around 800 to 900 RPM and you can speed it up to 1200 RPM. Under good conditions like the beets are here right now, uh, 850, 900 is ample. But under tough conditions, we need to speed it up and get down as far as we can to clean off the beet. So we just finished talking about the uh, frozen beets or uh, Sacospora beets where the leaves are tough and we talked about that what we can do with a defoliator and the scalper. Another point of trying to clean that material off the beet is right here on the turbines where you get that scrubbing action. We need to take the gates off and put pigtails on there so we get that rubbing action and it will take a lot of that rubbery stuff off the beets. And some people, the discussion is, do you have the turbines half full or right full? I see it a little bit like thrashing in a combine. Fill it up, let the beets rub each other, rub hard up against the pigtails and get that garbage off. So as the beets come around this side, it will clean off the one side of that flow. Through the second turbine, it cleans off the other side of the flow. And then the third turbine, once again, before it goes in the machine.